But first, announced as a grid of money-making when it was drawn up, the 1811 plan for Manhattan Island, dividing it into a matrix of right-angle streets and avenues, was much more than that. Now on Radio 4, the New York historian Hilary, Hilary Ballon, city walker Barry Lewis, the subway explorer Bob Diamond and others tell the story of the map that made Manhattan. On the grid, well, we're on the west side. This cross street, 6th Avenue and 16th Street. We're on 2nd Avenue and 18th Street. On the east side of the street, on the northeast corner, do you know the Between 16th and 15th Street on 7th Avenue. It's 106th Street, 1st Avenue. You make a left and you just go straight up to 5th Avenue. A city that is built on a grid is a city that is built on reason. On 18th, going east to west, and on, I'm guessing this is 5th. Well, it's the XYZ coordinates. Second Avenue and 21st. It's geometry. 155th Street, 145th Street. It's the grid. 103rd Street. It's an artificially man-made creation. 86th Street. Every inch had to be engineered. Every nut and bolt, every piece of rail, every light bulb fixture had to be engineered. It's a system of perception. It's not just a way of organizing buildings. It's an actual, real, physical way of organizing space and time and experience. Oh, I didn't hear the what? The grid. Run 18th and 5th. Downtown, west side. East 106th Street and 2nd Avenue. This is 21st Street. Hilary Ballon, historian of architecture and of cities. And, um, 77th Street. The numbered streets of New York are so familiar now that it's easy to imagine that it was the automatic condition. But that was not the case. The grid was utopian in many respects. We can look back to antiquity. We can see the tradition of Roman city planning and of classical Greek city planning. But the idea of a modern city based on the grid was an extremely bold idea. Remarks of the commissioners for laying out streets and roads in the city of New York. Governor Morris, Simeon DeWitt, and John Rutherford. One of the first objects which claimed their attention was Looking the here at the 1811 map of the island of Manhattan that was drawn by John Randall Jr., the chief surveyor of the city, you can see this vision. To the better understanding of the map, the term avenue is applied to all those streets which run in a northerly direction parallel to each other and are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, it's just a pattern of numbered avenues running up the island and cross streets that intersect it at right angles, running east-west from river to river. Those passages which run at right angles to the avenues are termed streets and are numbered consecutively from 1 to 155. These streets are all 60 feet wide, except 15, architects, which are 100 New York, wide. and Paris. Numbers 14, 23, to start with, the grid is an abstraction. 57, 72, it's simply the crossing of lines at right angle to other lines. 135, 145, and 155. It can be compared to a weave, it can be compared to a mesh. But first of all, it's an abstraction. The avenues to the eastward of number one are marked A, B, C, and D. It's a construction of the mind. Between the first and second avenues is 650. Before the grid, the New York did not have a governing model. It grew piecemeal the side of the third street, as demand required just, a new street and the was built. The first and third streets are of equal width. What happened with the establishment of the grid in 1811 was a decision to create a unifying system for the rest of the island. No more organic growth, no more piecemeal growth, but rather creating a system that would be imposed on the island as a whole. The city is to be composed principally of the habitations of men. Straight-sided and right-angled houses are the most cheap to build and the most convenient to live in. 
the effect of these plain and simple reflections was decisive. The work in general should be rectangular. This is 7th and Greenwich Avenues, where 11th Street crosses them both. It's on this side of the city where the Manhattan grid begins. Barry Lewis, architectural historian and city walker. We laid down the grid in 1811 when this city was already existing for 150 years. So the grid does not start at the southern tip of Manhattan Island. The Dutch founded New Amsterdam down there, the English spread the city, and when we finally get to the early 19th century, we live in a city that was like a crazy quilt of streets. You tried to get cross town, you were like a jackrabbit. We are one of the great ports of America, we call ourselves the Empire City, and we can't even get cross town. So, a commission decided we are going to have a single grid on Manhattan Island, from the East River to the Hudson, and from South to North. But since the city had already been in existence a good number of generations, the grid of 1811 could only start about two miles north of the Battery, where the city originally began. Now, you must remember in 1811, our rivers were the highways of New York, the East River and the Hudson River. The grid was laid out with many east-west streets because they assumed all of us would want to go from river to river, from river to river. But it was only laid out with 12 north-south avenues plus Broadway because in 1811 people said, if you are going to go up the entire distance of Manhattan Island, you're not going to be a fool and take a road. You would take a boat. Pier Vittorio Aurelli, architect. The first really organized use of the grid as a city-making principle, it's a legacy from the Greek-Roman civilization. In the ancient Greek polis, which were independent uh, city-states, there were a lot of conflicts, not only actually between cities, but also within cities. So the grid was really thought to be, let's say, a rational way to allow a certain number of people to basically live together and to recognize their limits, their own let's say, sense of orientation uh, within the city. In the course of the history, especially with the conquest of the Americas, the grid was a way to start from scratch, to start from an ideal order, a way to refound an ideal city, an ideal way to coexist. And of course, the Manhattan grid is very aggressive. It's really a superimposition of this order. In fact, this grid became an incredibly successful commercial machine, successful from the point of view of the market, uh, maybe not completely from the point of view a more kind of civic, if you want, understanding of the city. The commissioners were motivated by the spirit of founding a new country. And the most relevant model that they would have had in mind was the creation of Washington, D.C a counter model for them. Washington did have an underlying orthogonal grid, but then imposed on it were a set of squares connected by diagonal boulevards. And those diagonal boulevards not only connected the squares, but major monuments that represented the political order of the country. That plan, designed by Pierre L'Enfant, was inspired by the Baroque cities of Europe. So think Christopher Wren, think Paris, think the Rome of Bernini in the 17th century, and with these great representational spaces. And that was suitable for the nation's capital. But what they were thinking for New York was this is not a city where representation and symbolism and oval squares and stars cut out of the urban fabric would be suitable. What they wanted was an efficient framework for development. Rectangular buildings on rectangular lots, it's land for sale to anyone. In 1807, Simeon DeWitt, Governor Morris, and John Rutherford are commissioned to design the model that will regulate the final and conclusive occupancy of Manhattan. Twelve avenues running north-south and 155 streets running east-west. <laughs> 
a city of 2,028 blocks excluding topographical accidents, a matrix that captures at the same time all remaining territory and all future activity on the island. The Manhattan Grid. Advocated by its authors as facilitating the buying, selling, and improving of real estate, it is the most courageous act of prediction in Western civilization. The land it divides, unoccupied. The population it describes, conjectural. The buildings it locates, phantoms. The activities it frames, non-existent. Rem Koolhaas, Delirious, New York, 1978. Anthony Bidler architectural critic and historian, New York City. It could be said that the grid is a way of establishing something new, some new identity. But in the end, I think it follows the colonial model. It's easy to establish a grid in unbuilt and unmapped territory, to scale it, to plot it, to map it as a part of a territory that is now owned, that is now taken, that is now under if you like, surveillance and territorial control. Eric Sanderson, I'm an ecologist at the Wildlife Conservation Society, Bronx Zoo, New York. If we imagine what Manhattan was like 400 years ago, we would have seen an ecosystem. We would have seen 55 different ecological communities, over a thousand different species. Not a place that wasn't without people. There had been Native Americans, North Americans, living there for some 8,000 years before Europeans arrived. Beaches, wetlands, plains, grasses, 66 miles of streams and rivers, and over 500 different hills and valleys on Manhattan. All of this, of course, was eventually leveled as the grid was created. Manhattan had been a much hillier place before the grid was built. In order to build these 10-mile-long avenues and these cross streets, it was necessary to level the island. The adoption of the grid required decades of actual construction and massive changes to the landscape. They would blow up rock outcrops and hills that were in the way. They would fill valleys. The idea was to have a horizontal plane or as near a horizontal plane as they could create. And it happened in waves. First, the street commissioners came and began the survey. Then the tax assessments, then the leveling and the grading, the infrastructure of the city. Soon enough, gas lines and sewers were built around the framework of the grid. It's really quite a massive undertaking if you think about it, because it was a time before fossil fuels and bulldozers. These are, you know, men and boys with picks and shovels, uh, TNT to blow things up. And only at the end were the streets actually paved. And as this process of laying out the streets advanced, you could see that the value of the adjacent property increased. The more the city invested in infrastructure, the more valuable the real estate became. And it took into the early 20th century for the vision of the grid adopted in 1811 to be fully realized. Although there were remnants, for example, there was a large tree that was 100 feet high that was on Fifth Avenue that survived until 1916. There's some very kind of sad pictures of this one tree surrounded by buildings and streets from the early 20th century until finally it died and had to be cut down. The grid didn't only control what was above ground. It also became a framework for what was below ground. The next stop is 155th Street. And so the street and system the increasingly door, structured the way in which the various underground systems were built. If you have a transparency of the map of the subway system and lay it over a map of the street grid, you're going to see that they're one and the same and it coincide 95% of the time. Looking at the grid itself, it's like looking at a finely cut crystal. It has crystalline logic to it, where you could have public transportation, public utilities, water, sewer, gas, electric, and communications, fiber optics. My name is Bob Diamond. I'm a rail advocate and subway explorer here in New York City.
I've always been interested in the New York subway system ever since I was a child, mainly because of riding in the first car and looking out the storm door and in some places seeing tunnels going off into the distance where the tracks had been ripped out and wondering where those tracks had once led. It's the sounds, it's the smell. Uh, you know, back in the day before they got the more modern cars, the older cars used to have friction bearings. They had this grease on the axles. And when that axle grease would heat up, it had this smell that was not like anything else. And they used to have orange juice vendors at various subway stations on the platforms. And the smell of the fresh orange juice mixing with the journal box oil made this aroma that there's nothing else like it. It's indescribable. This is a 57th Street, 7th Avenue bound Q express train. The next stop is Times Square, 42nd Street. All of those subsurface facilities that are necessary for modern metropolis could not have existed without the grid system facilitating a public right-of-way and a rational linear pattern across the city. So, you know, looking up through the ventilator shaft, the surface of the sidewalk is only about eight feet above my head. This is full run. Wait, look for train to go by. Would you like me to hit you? Yeah, you try that, Four Eyes, you dumb butts. Cliff Adler, and I'm driving a taxi for uh, 38, 39 years in New York City. See, they went right to the red light. They don't care. There's people all over the damn place. There's cars all over the place. God, they're stupid. They got an ambulance trying to get through, and these knuckleheads sit there like they're frozen, just crossing 3rd Avenue. 2nd Avenue, just on 39th Street now, we're going to have to go around the block to head down Lexington the other side of park is closed because of a street fair. It's the bane of our existence. They close the whole street for 20 blocks. And for the life of me, I don't understand it. And you have a street fair. And basically all they sell is crappy sausage, uh, tube socks, and uh, some really bad French grapes, grossly overpriced. The grid system is probably the best system for the city. Circles are no better. Traffic gets all bogged down anyway. So I don't see how circles could benefit, certainly not a city like New York, especially when you think it's 13 and a half miles long by, for the most part, two and a quarter miles wide. Where are you going to put the circles? You know? So you are restricted to having, the way I see it, a grid system, and it's probably the best system, but it's how you use the grid system. No, the bus can't get around the corner. He can't get around the corner, so he's probably going to... He's fighting with a dump truck. That's not a smart move. But that's an out-of-town bus anyway, so, you know, whatever. We just crossed one of the major two-way streets, 34th Street. Now uh, on Lexington, going down, just passing 32nd Street. Riding uptown right now to Union Square, 14th Street on the Lexington Avenue line. Above us is the amazing street grid system of New York, but alongside of us are four-foot diameter and larger water mains, three-foot diameter gas pipes, sewers below us, 27,000 volt power lines above us. What better way to go and impose order out of chaos than to put a Cartesian coordinate system in the city of New York that everything had to conform to no matter what. An inviolable system of a grid that can never be diverged from. As a driver, it's easier. Like, uh, say you want to go in the middle of a block somewhere. Say you're going to 27th Street. It's easier if you tell a driver, take me to 27 and 6. Then they have an intersection to go to. They know where they're heading for. We define ourselves by the coordinates of the grid. We're on 2nd Avenue and 18th Street. 119 and 2nd. 19th and Broadway. And we define ourselves in terms of the rest of the city by the coordinates of the grid. 6th Avenue and 16th Street. 30th Avenue and 20th Street. When you reference a coordinate of the grid. That means you're talking about an intersection. On the grid, I'm on 6th Avenue between 16th and 17th, I believe. 21st Street, between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. And then you say, I'm going between the block, between 6 and 7. So they know they carry on down the block because it's a westbound street, okay? If you said you were going to 26 and 6, between 5th and 6th, you go up to 7th on 27th Street, circle the block, and then come back in on 26th because it's one way west and one way east. I could be down on 18th and 8th 
and talk about being up on First Avenue and 86th. And I may never have been to First and 86th, but I instantly know where I am. So each coordinate basically references all the other coordinates of the city. The grid, it's, it's like a checkerboard. And you're moving your piece across these very clear, clearly identified squares. Paul Oster, City of Glass, from the New York Trilogy, 1985. He walked down Broadway to 72nd Street, turned east to Central Park West, and followed it to 59th Street and the Statue of Columbus. There he turned east once again, moving along Central Park South until Madison Avenue, and then cut right walking downtown to Grand Central Station. After circling haphazardly for a few blocks, he continued south for a mile, came to the juncture of Broadway and Fifth Avenue at 23rd Street, paused to look at the Flatiron Building, and then shifted course, taking a westward turn until he reached 7th Avenue. New and Yorkers, we are trained by the grid. We walk the city. Square, he turned east again. We walk the city fast and in lockstep. We know these streets are not going to end in three blocks. These streets will go as far as we need to take them. Park Avenue South. At 23rd Street, he jockeyed north. A few blocks later, he jutted right again, went one block to the east, and then walked up 3rd Avenue for a while. At 32nd Street... New York City has the repetition of the grid, and yet at every street corner, on every block, or almost every block, a different configuration. At 32nd Street, he turned right, came upon 2nd Avenue, turned left, moved uptown another three blocks, and then turned right one last time, whereupon he met with 1st Avenue. This is somehow the power of this abstraction that is the grid. It can accommodate the accident and the unpredictable. So the grid is valueless. It's what you make out of it. It's sometimes said that the virtue of the grid as applied to many American cities, and Manhattan in particular, is that it has a kind of democratic instrumentality, that it doesn't privilege centers, that it doesn't privilege large public monuments, that it privileges the citizen in the street as part of a mass of all citizens in all the streets, and therefore has a certain egalitarianism built into it. It's a perception that the grid holds, but I think what the grid does is it highlights inequality in a very dramatic way. In most European cities where we experience slum conditions or poverty conditions or dangerous conditions, it's fairly clear that it's that area as opposed to this area that is not in the center and it's in the periphery. In New York, it can change from one street to the next, one block to the next. You can have an incredibly depressed area next to an incredibly affluent area. One street, two streets, one block, two blocks, and it just changes because real estate changes. And in the end, as Marx had it, it's the ground rent that counts New York is always described with great truth as a city that doesn't value the past. It is always about the new, and buildings are ruthlessly demolished in order to make way for the new. The paradox is that all of that development takes place on a footprint established in 1811. So this historic framework, our grid, is what frames, outlines the development of the city, which because of the ever-increasing real estate values in New York, driving up the value of that land, buildings get taller and taller and taller. As Cass Gilbert said about the skyscraper, it is a machine to make money out of the land. The more stories you add, the more revenue you make. And New York goes tall on its historic grid because of its extraordinarily valuable real estate. You might say that the grid itself, and especially if you look at the 1811 map, is the most monotonous system applied with absolute rigorous intensity across the island. While the horizontal aspect might be monotonous, its vertical aspect is certainly not. And obviously 
the skyscraper system of Manhattan has literally elevated that to the fine art. No building ever built in New York was placed where it was or shaped as it was because it would contribute to the aesthetic effect of the skyline, lifting it here, giving it mass there, or lending a needed emphasis. What then makes possible the fluid and ever-changing unity which does in fact exist? The gridiron pattern of the city streets. A diagram of the idea of the social contract. And this simple gridiron pattern horizontally controls the spacing and arrangement of the isolated rectangular shafts which go to make up the city skyline. What matters there is the vertical thrust, the motion upward, and that is the product of cage or skeleton, construction and steel. A system of construction which is, in effect, merely a three-dimensional variant of the grid street plan. Extending vertically, instead of horizontally. John A. Kuvenhoven, The Beer Can by the Highway, 1961. The skyline and skyscrapers of New York can be thought of as being a vertical grid. And similarly, the subway system is an inverse underground skyline of New York. Pretty much the engineer who designed the subway here in New York, William Barclay Parsons, got the idea to take the skeleton for a high-rise building and lay it horizontally under the street grid as though it was a horizontal skyscraper, except it's under the city grid. We see H-beams, we see I-beams, we see hot rivets, we see reinforced concrete. All the same ingredients used to build New York City's vertical skyline were used to build its horizontal skyline, which you can't see from the surface. The endurance of the grid is one of its most remarkable features. When established in 1811, the commissioners couldn't have imagined skyscrapers. They couldn't have imagined the kind of developments that would take place. But yet that grid has served the city well. It's optimistic to look up 8th Avenue from its very beginnings here around 12th and 13th Streets and to be able to see a vista that seems to stretch to eternity. It certainly stretches as far as Central Park and that's almost three miles from where we are now. And we are looking up through one of the most crowded, densest cities in the world, Manhattan Island, and yet look at all the sky that we see. Look at the wideness of the avenue, the visual clarity. The Baroque Boulevard always ended in a grand vista, a statue, a building, or a fountain. And it told you that the boulevard had limits. The New York Avenue has no limits. Its vista goes into the horizon. The irony of Manhattan is that it is an island, and it does end but the grid that was imposed on it could be extended forever. The map that made Manhattan was produced by Simon Hollis and was a Brooklyn.